First of all, I would like to ask to thank my old friend, one of my oldest friends, Ettore Cittadini, for the invitation. You know, if you are old, this kind of ceremony are always welcome. Especially this ceremony, because started to me as pieces of reflex. I went back to 36 years ago when I organized in Carmel, California for the Serrano Group. The first, I think it was, it was the first formal international meeting on IVF, just at the beginning of the experience with the new technology. And uh, uh, the event took place in a beautiful, charming little city in Northern California, Carmel, near San Francisco, on 24 and 25th October. And uh, many were the presentation, and we organized to publish this presentation next year under a volume of Serrano Clinical Colloquia. It was quite a good idea because it was something just showing you in number what was the real world experience in terms of IVF in October 82. All major groups were represented and I would like to remind the three major areas, the major group, number one, Bournol, and I'm really glad because uh, Simon Fisher is still here. He's the only one <laughs> uh, uh, lecturer in these two faraway <laughs> events. So thanks uh, again, Sam. And uh, at that time, Bournol had 101 deliveries due to IVF. The, in the Melbourne area, there were two very active groups, and both together contributed to 130 uh, deliveries in October 82. And for the entire US, the contribution was smaller because uh, Norfolk, Los Angeles and Houston contributed only by 94 deliveries at that time. So we were just at the beginning and uh, it is a fortunate event today to compare the, uh, just the, the, the experience, the maturity of the methodic just uh, well established and everywhere active in the world. And having that, said that, let me give the podium to my co-chairman for the presentation of the rest of the session, please. Thank you, Professor Corzignani. And um, first of all, let me thank um, uh, Professor Cittadini for the kind invitation and uh, for organizing this incredible and beautiful meeting. And um, we start, I have the, the pleasure and the honor to introduce the first session of the meeting. And the first speaker is André van Stertegem uh, from Belgium, is one of the most important uh, scientists in the field of reproductive medicine and one of the father of intracytoplasmic sperm injection. The title of, of his presentation is Innovation by Chance. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, of course, I want to start by thanking for the invitation to participate in this quite special meeting on state of the art 40 years after the birth of Louise Brown. I would especially like to thank Professor Cittadini and Luca Gianaroli for allowing me to be present here even four weeks after I had 
a hip, rep uh, hip replacement operation. I have no competing interest to declare. And let me say from the beginning that my contribution reflects the work over the years of many colleagues at the Center for Reproductive Medicine in Brussels in the period starting in 1980 until now. In Brussels, we started clinical IVF in January 1983. It was a very small team guided by Paul de Vrooy, the clinician, and myself as the reproductive biologist. We had to thank the Monash group where we attended the first IVF workshop in July 1982. I now start to go a little bit faster. We had the first birth of the first IVF child in Brussels in November 1983. And of course, much later, in 1992, in January, was the first birth of the first ICSI child. In terms of my view on how ICSI happened, I want to try to answer with you the following questions. Why did we start? What did we do? What did we find? And what does it mean? We all know that Louise Brown was born on the 25th of July in 1978. And it was already mentioned by Professor Crossignani. What happened in the United Kingdom was followed by births in Australia, the United States of America, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and also in Belgium in 1983. And we're talking at that time on conventional IVF. And it was good, it was successful for tubal and idiopathic infertility. But it didn't have a good outcome in male infertility, especially when the semen parameters were quite abnormal. Excuse me for poor, I tried to correct it into real poor, P-O-O-R, but it didn't come out. But in male infertility, the chances of fertilization and embryo transfer were very reduced if the semen parameters were impaired. And then for these couples, in fact, quite the only thing that they could do was have artificial insemination with donor sperm as an alternative treatment. At the end of the 1980s, many groups started to try to assist the fertilization process. The first attempt was zona drilling, which worked well in mice, but never in the human. Shortly thereafter, there was partial zona dissection, where you make a mechanical slit in the oocytes, which were then incubated in a sperm suspension. We observed and observed fertilization, but many times it was polyspermic fertilization. And so that we can conclude that the clinical results were quite inconsistent. And here you see a cartoon of partial zona dissection. 
About the same time or a little later, there were a few case reports in Singapore mm, and in Rome, Simon Fischel, about fertilization and embryo development and a few births after subzonal insemination. And at that time, we decided at the VUB to try to invest in this approach of assisted fertilization. But we have always had as a principle that before doing a clinical application, we try to at first do experimental work and preclinical research. And this was a decision for subzonal insemination as well. So here you see a cartoon of subzonal insemination. A few sperms are inserted in that very little space between the inside of the zona pellucida and the membrane of the oocyte. And we submitted, and I'm sure Jean Piero will remember that, we submitted a grant to the Fund for Scientific Research Flanders on experimental SUSI in mice as a model for eventual clinical application in the human. And the question we asked was, can the induction of acrosome reaction in mouse sperm by chemical means or electroporation result in fertilization and embryo development when one treated mouse sperm was injected subzonally. And it worked. We got good fertilization, embryo development, normal pups were born after transfer in pseudo-pregnant mice, and these mice were also able to reproduce. A paper was published at that time, it was still called gamete research, and these experimental results made us to consider clinical protocol for patients that had failed several cycles of conventional IVF because of abnormal sperm. We asked ethical approval to the hospital ethical committee and we obtained approval under certain conditions. First of all, that we had fully to fully inform the patients on the new procedure and still many unknown aspects of the outcome. Initially, the patients recruited were those with severe, several failed conventional IVF cycles because of abnormal sperm. And the couples accepted thorough follow-up of pregnancies and the children born, including prenatal diagnosis and prospective follow-up of children born. And this prospective follow-up of children was a joint project with the Center for Medical Genetics at our university. We had a number of pregnancies and births occurring after SUSI of a few spermatozoa which had been treated to induce acrosome reaction. Also, there are, there are a few publications on this. But as you well realize, SUSI is technically challenging, and it may occur, and it occurs sometimes. That was, and I looked at the records, it was called failed SUSI. And sometimes this was noticed. But sometimes we also notice that the sperm had entered the cytoplasm and that the next morning you saw two pronuclei and the day thereafter you saw four cell embryos. But we were a little bit still hesitant about that. But so we had observed fertilization and embryo development after this. And here you see the three types of assisted fertilization in a cartoon. But it happened that we had in these patients only 
embryos after failed SUSI. And this was how the first pregnancy occurred in 1991 with a birth in 14th of January 1992. In the beginning, we still continued, especially SUSI, but also then in combination with ICSI on a few oocytes. It became rapidly clear that more consistent results were obtained after ICSI than after SUSI. We went back to the ethical committee to apply for ethical approval of this ICSI, and we got it under the same conditions as of SUSI. And here is one of the initial nice pictures of intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And the results were as such that as of July 1992, at the VUB, we only practiced anymore assisted fertilization by ICSI and not anymore subzonal insemination. The first publication with the first four children was in July 1992 in the Lancet, Palermo, Joris, De Vrooy van Steertium. And afterwards, we published in July 1993 two larger series on ICSI in human reproduction. These three articles became citation classics. And, and now I'm talking about uh, what happened in citations in Belgium. These three papers have long been and may still be the most cited uh, Belgian articles. We decided at that time to be open to the world, showing ICSI in several live and video sessions, hand-on workshops, and of course, we got a lot of visitors from all over the world. I think this was a very deliberate attitude following my own personal experience of openness when I spent three years as a visiting scientist at the National Institutes of Health in the 70s, and also remembering the very open attitude of Monash University and also closer to Belgium, the group of Seilmaker and Alberta in Rotterdam. The following question, what did we found? Well, I think it's fair to say that ICSI proved to be a consistent treatment for the alleviation of severe male factor infertility, including cases of cryptozoospermia. But shortly afterwards, we could also use it with epididymal and testicular sperm, and the results of these attempts were similar as ICSI with ejaculated sperm, and if you compare it to conventional IVF for female or idiopathic infertility, we obtained similar results. Of course, in non-obstructive azospermia, you can only found, find sperm in about half of the patients. If this is the case, of course, then the only remaining alternative for these couples is artificial insemination with donor sperm. PGD was started around the same time as ICSI. And ICSI was from the beginning recommended for PGD because especially to avoid the contamination with sperm DNA adhering to the zona pellucida, or cumulus cells adhering to the uh, zona pellicity, and that you could cause contamination when you do the biopsy on these uh, oocytes 
uh, embryos with some sperm or cumulus cells attached. An important question is still, is ICSI safe? It was from the beginning, as was also conventional IVF earlier questioned, but ICSI especially because it was more invasive as conventional IVF and a number of steps in the fertilization process are bypassed. Preparing for this lecture, I asked where we were in Brussels now in terms of children born. This was 27,072 as of last Wednesday. ICSI children, close to 21,000 children. 16,424 16, after fresh transfer and 4,431 after frozen embryo transfer. In our program, in the follow-up program, as well as in many other results that have been published, it indicates that there is a slight increase in chromosomal anomaly, slightly more malformations, but there is no difference between ICSI and conventional IVF. And also after PGD, the children do as well, PGD's children as ICSI children. What does it mean now? I think we can say that the successful introduction of ICSI has meant that the majority of couples with severe male factor infertility can now have their child wish with an own genetic child fulfilled. A number of centers started not using any more conventional IVF, but only ICSI. I think this can be part of a large discussion. We also must remember that after ICSI, there are too many multiple pregnancies after ICSI, but of course now we have a good way of treating that, that single embryo transfer. In terms of the follow-up, we have now in Brussels data on some of the ICSI boys and IVF young ladies at an age where they are able. And I can tell you that at the next uh, ASHRI meeting in Barcelona, Human reproduction opening lecture will be a paper published at the end of or the beginning of 2017 by Belva et al. on semen characteristics of ICSI boys. And so, if you are in, in Barcelona, I think uh, you are certainly invited to that and you will learn more about that. I think at the end, I would like to conclude that I think it's important to continue clinical research, not the least on the long-term follow-up of ICSI children. But as you know, and it was already a big battle for the late Bob Edwards and many others, that funding for follow-up of children is very rare and difficult to obtain. Also, I think we should not forget that fundamental research on the physiopathology of infertility is and remains important. At the end of this talk, I would like to express my thanks to my mentors of the time in Brussels at the NIH and all over the world, and especially the loyal collaborations of clinicians and embryologists and scientists who worked with us at the Center for Reproductive Medicine and also as the colleagues of the Center of Medical Genetics. 
my, what I call here, partners in crime, Paul de Vrooy, and Inge Liebers of the Center for Med Medical Genetics, we are all emeritus. But I think we are proud that what we started is progressing, and I would say still improving every day now on. So thank you for your attention. And here you see that things have changed a lot since the early days in 1993, where we were a handful of persons working. But here you see one of the last group picture of the clinical uh, nursing, but also the different research teams involved now coming from this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Van Zetlegem. Are there some questions about uh, this um, presentation? No, I have a question. Uh, do you think that we there is a um, still space for IVF, or do you think that? <laughs> I think uh, it's a matter it's a matter of discussion nowadays. Personally, personally, but you know, and I'm not anymore heading a, a group. I think when all when the semen is normal, when the wife, the patient, the female patient produces a good number of oocytes, I don't see personally why we should do ICSI. But I know that there is a lot of debate about it. And I know that uh, the successor of Paul de Vrooy, Herman Tournay, he has been, you know, uh, debating pro and contra, you know, doing ICSI for home. But we have to recognize, yeah, we have to notice that nowadays, and we were discussing at breakfast, that in many centers now, it's um, 80 to 90 percent of all cycles are ICSI. That's a fact. But is it valid? It's a matter of different opinions. Thank you. Other question? Um, Christina Magne from Bologna. Uh, thank you very much, Andre, for your talk. Was really was really nice. Um, you have so many children born uh, after ICSI, and you report a slightly higher incidence of malformations, right? But Are this you... is the same in conventional IVF as in ICSI, as in PGD, oh. exactly. Okay, so it, it means that the severity of the male factor is not affecting the incidence, because if there are so many nowadays uh, ICSI done for almost no. normal dospermic patients, so can we see that difference? Uh, we haven't looked, I think nobody has looked yet so far for the indication that ICSI was done, normal sperm, or very severely abnormal sperm. I don't think that there are enough large series, but it becomes much more difficult to answer that question indeed, because of nowadays, it's, uh, ICSI is done with, let's say, rather normal semen parameters. I agree, but we don't know the answer yet. But it's certainly, a very valid remarks that we should keep in mind. Dietrich from Germany. Thank you, Andre, for your excellent lecture, as usually. Uh, I want to come back to this uh, question about the malformation. Uh, if the malformation rate is the same with ICSI and IVF and PGD, does this mean it is not the procedure of the injection of the spermatozoa? Well, that's what we can conclude from this, 
And maybe, and this has been already, and there have been several articles about that, that the status of infertility per se may also have been a contributing factor to some problems in pregnancy. This reflects also, if you just look at the time to pregnancy in couples, the worse is the sperm, the longer the period also of uh, infertility. So I think there may be a link, but it's hypothetical. There is I mean, no substance to prove this, but it's certainly something we have to consider. Andre, Simon Fischel, thank you again. I uh, repeat the comments of our colleagues on your excellent talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you, do you think there's a third way uh, with IVF versus ICSI in that wherever possible, and these days most of the time we get quite a lot of metaphase 2 eggs, we should be obliged in cases where the sperm factors are not evident for ICSI in some form or other, to undertake uh, an IVF ICSI procedure on, on the sibling oocytes, on the same cohort, to get an understanding for the sake of the patients, whether or not ICSI is, is required. We started this years ago, at the very beginning, uh, but the problem then is the regulator in the UK, which is a, another interesting piece of history, brought in their crazy 2% rule, uh, which meant that we weren't allowed to transfer embryos from an ICSI mix unless it was under 2% of our total cases, which was crazy. But now that we, a lot of us move to single embryo transfer anyway, and we've got uh, excellent conditions to do that, it seems to me that there's a third way to look at whether ICSI should be uh, almost mandatory offered in the right circumstances uh, as part of a, a ICSI IVF cohort. I don't know what your view is on that. Well, I think this is uh, usually when you don't immediately know the answer, you reply. It's a good question, but uh, I must say, and uh, we discussed at one time at one of the Capri meetings, that applying, and there were some meta-analyses done, applying ICSI for non-male infertility didn't prove to be better than conventional IVF. There are some cases. Now, the case of sibling oocytes, I think at one time in Brussels, and it was Herman when he was still, Herman Tournay when he was still on the staff, not yet, it's several decades ago, we looked on sibling oocytes at a certain category of sperm, whether high, in, high insemination, high number of spermatozoa in insemination with uh, conventional IVF, gave the same results as ICSI in these patients. But I have to confess, I should, have, I should look up the paper to, to remember the exact results. Hi. Uh, you may not remember, but uh, we had the discussion very early on when um, Tarlasis came to visit once. We just got the initial result and you and Tarlasi were the opinion that in order to propose this to the public we have to do mix sibling oocyte on standard in vitro insemination and whatever assisted I don't know that we were doing ICSI yet but to do the mix um, approach in order like uh, Jacques Coyne was doing in, in New York and I remember getting a lot of heat out of that because I say absolutely not because I say I do not agree with that approach because I think at the end we won't end up mixing the embryo for replacement. Uh -huh. So, um, and uh, you and, uh, and Basile were so kind and understanding and respect my approach. And I, my, the agreement was the, um, at the end that we would do IVF as much as we could, one time, two times, or three times, when there was no other option, then we would attempt assisted fertilization. Correct. I think we have to stop because the time is passing very fast. 
And now, thanks again, uh, Andre, because you presented.